In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. Gabriel and Lynn, those gathered here today, family and friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In Dubuque, Iowa, overlooking the mighty Mississippi, there's a church that has more Tiffany glass than any other church in the country. I don't know if it was the tastes of the congregation or of the Tiffany studio, but some of the themes depicted in the windows aren't typical. When I visited this congregation with my family several years ago, I was struck by the window of the balcony, the largest window by far. Represented on it was not a depiction of Christ or of some New Testament saint, but of Job. Job. Surely the guy who endured much suffering in his life is a person that we would rather forget about. Despite my objections, looming over the congregation was the Old Testament prophet enshrined in the books of Hebrew poetry, a book that deals with the question of evil and hard times and the preeminent question, why do bad things happen to good people and why is there suffering in this world? When I found, found out the date of your wedding, I went to the church's calendar. Those who are liturgically minded follow time not through the world's march of death, but through God's accounts of restoration, redemption, and recreation. So there I read, May 9th, the commemoration of Job. What would Job have to teach about marriage? Let's just say outright that Job is no love story. It's not what we would call a romantic comedy. And yet there are things that we can be taught that we will consider today. First of all, you Gabriel and you Lynn are to understand your calling to married life happens within the vicissitudes of life. That should be obvious to you, even now as your planned wedding day was interrupted by a situation beyond your control. Ten people or so at your wedding was not what you imagined. This journey is one where you will have the kind of things happen that you never quite planned for or prepared for. This is the dose of reality that Job adds. We know not what is in store for you, but we know that there will be pains as well as joys and lows other than the highs that you now experience on this most blessed occasion and day. But God calls you to married life in this, in this knowledge. He calls you to faith in the Son of God, Jesus, the one who loves you and the one who gave his life for you on the cross. God was above the story of Job, only those who are reading that book can see it. We know what God is doing as we read it, yet Job and his wife only see the dark face of God. That's how it will sometimes seem. They and you are called to believe in God's yes and surely so. Yet even more, there's something to learn, and today something to rejoice in. As you now go down on this path, you after today, do not go at it alone. You go hand in hand. That does not mean that you will always be of one mind and heart and body, but it will be something that you always strive for, something that you seek always and ever to attain. That union that is your desire and constant work. God places you together. It was not good that man be alone. And so God folds you today together into one. And he himself gives to you today certain promises. He says to you today, I'll be with you in those dark corners. 
I'll be with you in those times when things are troublesome with God with you. It means that you're on a journey with a specific goal. You're not on a merry-go-round, going in a circle day after day, never getting anywhere. That's the world's understanding of life. You are on the timeline of the vast scope of God's history. You're walking with the saints, walking with Job and his wife like those who've gone before you and ever still walk with you and above you. You have before you a goal, union with God, an answer you will make on the final day of judgment. And there's a higher thing that motivates you, something that brings joy and meaning to your relationship even more than the relationship itself. The knowledge of your Savior's giving himself for you and for your spouse. His love for them too which, if you can imagine, is greater always than your love for them. There's that joy hidden in your bosom of one day passing that spouse off to God's care. The second thing to consider is that the curse of the fall causes all manner of hardships which affects faith and married life. We see that in Job's case. Times of joy and happiness gave way to times of abject evil. Sickness plagued him. Death came to his house. It was more than he or his wife could handle. She did not know at that point if a God who allowed the death of her ten children at once in a tragic accident, the loss of all of her earthly possessions, was worthy of her worship. Curse God and die, she said to Job, her husband, bitter of the troubles, likely willing too that she would die, and God be cursed also. Yet in her moment of greatest doubt, when her faith was only as good as what was in her storehouses, her husband Job rebuked her with salient words. You speak, he said to her, as one of the foolish women speak. In other words, my dear wife, you are not such. You are not like that. You are not like them. And then these words of deepest hope, taught in the trenches of greatest suffering, were spoken by Job. Shall we, he says, indeed, accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Job was the preacher of his house, and in her moment of greatest darkness, he came with the word of God. He came with a fitly spoken word to cause her to look upward and to repent. We're so apt to accept when God sends us lottery tickets and rainbows. But if it is right to say this when blessing is hand-delivered by God that he has sent it, what happens when the eye of the storm is seen in the silver platter? Is God still God? And so there is loss, and there is darkness, and there is the curse. It's the hidden part of this book. But having nothing, all his friends that have left him the devil that accuses him, no child or earthly good left. Job still has one thing on earth, one thing good. She's there, something to live for, something to die trying for too. Marriage in long periods of it provide time. Time is God's gift of grace for repentance and recognition and reconciliation. Marriage is a time for wrestling and seeking for God and his mercy and grace. And that is something that you get to do together. For there is something deeper and bigger than the two of you, the Holy Trinity. 
God is using your marriage ground as the very field where he plays out the vast eternal story of his love for you. And finally, there is also in Job bright moments of joy. It may seem silly to say it or rather cliche, but take out the B at the end of Job's name and add a Y. And instead, what do you get? Job turns to joy. The early church read this book of Job during Holy Week as a picture of the sufferings of Jesus. He's the one who died for you. He endured the sufferings of this life and the assaults of Satan that he might redeem you from sin, death, and the accusations of Satan and hell. In Job's life, you see that because of Christ, after death comes resurrection. Job comes to his famous statement. If anyone knows anything of the book of Job, they know this. He comes to the highest point in the book, right in the middle of it, in chapter 19, while he is still amid things that he cannot see the ending of. In chapter 19, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I will see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Here is the joy of knowing the Redeemer who comes to redeem from sin, death, and every fear. He who himself was accused, tried, tempted, despised, and suffered even unto death, brings and will bring you redemption. At the end of the book, Job's losses were restored and doubled. It's an interesting part, that beginning and the end of the book. Job's wife came around, we do know as we see that in the end, ten more children were granted. What God takes away, God gives even more for those who love him, whether in this life or in the next. But of all the things that were doubled for Job, there was one thing that was not. Double the camels, double the donkeys. But interestingly enough, not double the children. Why is that? The church father, St. John Chrysostom, writes this. Job lost his children, but he received, not those restored, but others in their place. Yet even those he still held in assurance until the day of resurrection. In other words, he lost the camels, but he never really lost his children, for they died redeemed by Christ. Even if in this life there is loss, God can repay, repay what in his goodness he sees fit to take away. And there's no permanent loss in this life when we follow him, only eternal gain. In pain there's only the knowledge that even in evil he works his good for those who love him. And even then we should accept from him, as Job said, evil as well as good. And so the book ends with these words. That the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. In all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died, old and full of days. The Apostle James is the only one in the New Testament to mention Job specifically, and he writes these words. You have heard of the perseverance of Job, and you have seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. 
And so in your marriage, may God grant you the patience of Job, the joy and the life he and his wife shared, their faith in God's promises, their companionship that stood the test of difficult times, their joy in God, and their submission to his will. Like the stained glass window in Dubuque, Iowa, may that sentiment, the faith of Job, loom large always over your marriage. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.